All right, good morning. Good morning. Let's try that again. Are you awake? Good morning. All right. You were up late last night at the Echoes of Hope, probably. Uh, were, you, were you downtown Rib Lake, any of you? That was a wonderful event, and I think we might have uh, come upon something we want to repeat, uh, COVID era or not, S some ceremonial lighting of the tree in downtown, just like New York. Um, the streets were packed in a COVID-appropriate way, and uh, we celebrated the right thing. We celebrated um, what Christmas is about, and, and Pastor, one of the phrases, does Pastor say things sometimes that make you think? Uh, he, he, said a, he said a phrase, we are shaped by what we celebrate. And uh, when he first said it, I was like, well, what does he mean by that? And then I started thinking, oh, yeah, things that we do celebrate do tend to be our focus and our emphasis and what we care about the most. And uh, so it was a great reminder. There's lots that we aren't celebrating or lots that's different, but what we are celebrating is Jesus, and that does not change, that he came to earth and died for us. What a gift that God sent. And we are celebrating communion this morning. So if you are at home, and that's a surprise to you, uh, it's at the end of the sermon, sermon, right? So you have some time, find your elements, uh, a bread-like substance, and a fruit of the vine, as uh, Pastor says. And you can join us for communion at home then after. Uh, we have an exciting announcement about ladies' retreat. Um, due to some scheduling issues and just the whole uh, era that we're living in, it's moved from March to fall. All right, so ladies retreat, they're really excited to announce that it'll be held in the fall, October 7th through the 10th. And the very first thing my mom told me last night when she said, hey, Brad, make sure you make this announcement, is the, the fort told them you could do things in the fall that you couldn't do in spring, like when you come in spring normally, ladies. Like now in fall, you could do trap shooting. Okay, so you might have a whole new array of different things that you can do, ladies, at the fall retreat, different than the winter retreat. So... Put that on your calendar and uh, think about that. Um, due to our um, two weeks that we had to be off here, uh, we've extended the, the giving time to give those missionaries a, a special uh, Christmas offering from us here at church. Um, you'll find those envelopes uh, somewhere near your seat or in your pod there. There's a couple envelopes. Um, and we had tried to do that earlier and get that to them before Christmas happened, but it was hard because we weren't here. So that envelope is there and available for you to use. Just we want to bless our missionaries uh, with a special gift from our church family uh, this year. Um, if you are not aware, uh, Pastor Michael uh, is not feeling well and has, uh, is uh, staying home, so there's no middle school and high school youth group this week. No middle school or high school youth group this week. And then today, for the Sunday school hour, uh, junior, senior hires, you get to choose. You can go with the adults in the Grove, or you can come to DL family uh, here in this, uh, it's in the sanctuary here. So those two choices for you. Um, let's see, two more announcements. One, uh, we are having a Christmas Eve service. So that's December 24th, Christmas Eve, okay, at 6.30 p.m. here at church. So you can put that on your calendar. That will happen. Uh, of course, we plan to do that, and we hope to do that uh, at 6.30, Christmas Eve. And then uh, our special missionary emphasis this week is uh, the Mike and Becky Polis family and their work at Harvest Home Farm. And... Um, they're, they're doing, they decided to go ahead with a living nativity uh, next weekend, I believe it is. So uh, it's the 12th and 13th, yep. So they asked that we would pray for that event, that the details would come together and that uh, the gospel would go out and, and uh, that you would protect their health and, uh, and all the, the different pieces and parts that make that happen. So we're going to lift them up in prayer here. Would you join me in praying? Lord, we do have much to celebrate in uh, the gift of Jesus, and when we contemplate our need for a Savior and what you did provide for us, uh, it does kind of clarify lots of other things, and uh, Lord, pray that you would do a work in our hearts that we would, we would celebrate that and that we would view all the things going on in our lives through that lens first, that you uh, loved us and sent a Savior in Jesus, one that we desperately needed. And whether we contemplate that for the first time today or for the thousandth time, may you continue to move our hearts more and more in a deeper understanding and appreciation for what you did at the cross and uh, for uh, your calling on our lives then as we're here and what you would have us to do. Lord, we think of the uh, Polises and uh, their great event coming up. Um, 
Lord, you have gifted them with great ways of connecting with people and just pray that their connections as they would do this living nativity, that they would come in contact with community people and others that, that you would use them to point, point uh, to you here at Christmas and that uh, you would just anoint their conversations and the connections they would make, that, that you would be at work as they do all the other work to make that, uh, that event happen. Pray that you'd watch over them and uh, protect their health, that they'd be able to do it, uh, protect uh, just all the logistics and, and the things that have to come together. Just pray that you would go before that and make that happen. And uh, again, that that event would, would be a blessing to you. And uh, Lord, we just pray that you'd encourage them in their ministry and keep them strong and continue to use the farm there uh, for your glory. Uh, Lord, we pray for those that are sick and struggling and, and uh, with the virus or with just lots of other things, Lord, just pray that we would turn to you, pray that we trust in you, and we know that we can trust in you because you are that great big God and uh, that you know us and you love us. Lord, today, we, may we focus on you and, and celebrate, 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 celebrate together as a family what great, great hope we have uh, in this Christmas season. In your name, amen. Amen. Thanks, Brad. You know, when I when I think uh, joy to the world, and that is, you know, kind of this, we're entering into that season where we say that a lot. Uh, I actually think Becky Polis's cookies, like that's the first thing that comes to mind. Is <laughs> you say joy to the world, and it's like, oh, Becky Polis's cookies. Um, so, good morning, everybody at home as well. And I, I think it'd be good maybe if we warm up our voices a little bit. Could I teach you a little? Uh, a non-descript uh, uh, sort of thing that we're going to do in the midst of this song. It goes, oh, 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 oh. And I repeat that. Oh, 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 oh. This is just, we're just warming up our lungs here. And then I, I usually go, oh. But the guys in the room, if you want to just go, oh, no judging. <laughs>
go ahead and have a seat. We've been tasked with uh, lighting the second Advent candle today. This is known as the Bethlehem candle in uh, some traditions. And um, we'll let it get lit here just to make sure things are working. All right. So Bethlehem, it's a... Uh, why Bethlehem? I think of the city where Jesus was born. Tell us. Bethlehem was the tiny, humble town where God sent Joseph and Mary to give birth to the hope and peace of the whole world. Yes. Yeah. Um, yes, Bethlehem was the small, humble town where Christ was born. And there are two passages that we're going to read that speak to this. One is in Micah chapter 5. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, I don't know how to pronounce this, I'm sorry. Uh, Though you were small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me, one who will be ruler over, over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. Therefore, Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labor gives birth and the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites. And um, Luke 2, 1 through 5. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Cornelius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was, one, he was, he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with, his, with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. Well, um, preparation, sometimes if, if it's, uh, I don't know about you, but for me, sometimes preparation is the hardest part um, we like to talk about Jesus coming. We, uh, whether it's getting ready for Christmas, we're excited for the results when everyone gets to the house and we're fellowshipping and eating and making that big meal is the hard part. Um, but perhaps it's even getting ready to worship the Lord or celebrate the Lord's table. Um, preparation can be the hardest part. And uh, as I thought about Bethlehem, Bethlehem was not ready. There was no room for him. Israel wasn't ready. You know, eventually Herod had to ask for directions. They weren't, they didn't know he was coming. They had 700 years to, Micah, as we read, knew this 700 years before, telling them exactly, this is where he's going to be born. This is what he's going to do. He's going to be a shepherd. And so as we think about uh, Bethlehem in this, uh, on this day, the second day of Advent, and um, I just hope we are, our hearts are prepared, that we're ready. And as we're getting ready for Christmas to celebrate, we're preparing and even more importantly, I hope we're ready for his second coming. Let's pray. Father, we are thankful that you are the God of peace and the God of hope, a peace that uh, can only come through knowing the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior. It's exciting to be celebrating him in this time, a very unique time, when there's very much uh, a world without peace, and, and uh, we're seeing around us a world without hope. Um, but we're thankful that many are being drawn uh, to you uh, in this year and in this time, uh, looking for hope and looking for peace. And so as we uh, look towards um, Advent and the celebration, again, remembering that your son came uh, as a baby uh, to this earth, we uh, look with hope to, to his second coming. Uh, guide us in this uh, service today as we continue to celebrate. In Jesus' name, amen. stand up. We think of these, these mangy shepherds 
outcast from their society out on the cold hills that night maybe a song came up in their desperation and their hope so sing it like a mangy shepherd people The 
Let's take a seat. We're going to learn a new song that we'll do at least this week and next um, that goes in well with, with where we're going here. There we go. And it has one line that's repeated over and over with slightly different melody every time. So that's just so that you can you know, be confused slightly. <coughs> but it says, there's hope for everyone. It says it just over and over. There's hope for everyone. And by the time we get to the end, it should be pretty clear in the lyrics where our hope comes from. Because we end up saying Jesus a lot. It may not even be up on the screen a lot, but we'll be singing it a lot. So I want you to learn it with us. Uh, chorus so that you know what it sounds like when we get there says we are waiting on the promise for the one who lights the darkness bending low to be among us bring your glory in the highest Jesus the angels sing there's hope for everyone to announce our king there's hope for everyone what good news they bring there's hope for everyone angels sing there's hope for everyone they come from afar there's for everyone, wise men saw the star. There's hope for everyone, shepherds heard the choir. There's hope for everyone from afar. There's hope for everyone. We are waiting on the promise for the one who
It is great to be together, no doubt. Well, let's take a minute before we get going, before we go to God's word, let's take a minute to pray for all those who aren't with us today. It's it's wonderful to see people gathering again, and I so look forward to, to seeing regathering begin to build and get stronger throughout the next year, but there's a great many of you out on the stream today, and, and we won't pray for you all by name. I don't know how we could do that. Um, a few of you, or, or, or really one of you, called in and asked to be prayed for by name, and Mike Herrenstein, we, we want to pray for you by name, and, uh, and, and pray the Lord's blessing over you as you go through your own COVID experience and, uh, and trust the Lord for you. So let's do that. Father, we are, are, are sobered by what's going on in our midst as a church family, and yet we are thankful that as we go through difficult times, you sharpen our focus, you sharpen our minds, you you. You, you, you show us the urgency of trusting in you and, and having faith and hardship. And, 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 and so we bring each other to you right now, asking for your provision and for your help, and yet at the same time being confident that you will provide and help us. We pray for healing for those who are, 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 are struggling with the virus, hurting or, 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 or maybe in quarantine and just being cautious, and whatever our experience, we, we, we trust in you. We pray especially for Mike and Becky. Uh, Mike is no stranger to trouble with health, and he has led us through his own experience with cancer and showed us how to trust in you in the midst of hardship. And, and now as he's in a particularly vulnerable state with the virus, we would ask that you would bring him through it and help him to, to, to trust you with great persistence and strength and help Becky shore up her heart that she would rely on you and feel the deep confidence in you that you will provide for her and for Mike. Help us, Lord, as we, as we remember that you are our hope, Jesus, and help us to celebrate the right things this Christmas, and we pray this in your name, amen. amen. Well, I also want to express my appreciation for a couple of people as we move forward. I, I want to give thanks for Pastor Michael. And uh, trust you're on the stream today, Michael. Thank you. On behalf of the whole church, you carried us over the last couple of weeks uh, during my own quarantine. And uh, Michael was going to preach once, so that wasn't a surprise. But preaching twice was a surprise. And like uh, every good preacher, Michael figured out how to turn one message into two. And in the years ahead, maybe you'll get good at turning one message into 10 and 20 and 30, and that's what good preachers do. Um, the, the only thing Michael needs is for me to disappear a little more often so that he can lead us, um, so that you can lead us more often. I know you don't believe that. Um, but that would be a blessing as well, so thank you. Also want to express my appreciation for uh, Matt and Anna Hoffland. And uh, you, you know, the event last night in Rib Lake, it was, a, it was a COVID experience. Without the virus, we wouldn't have been out there. We wouldn't have even thought of doing this. And, and yet the Lord provided this opportunity to get out into the darkness and bring some light, to get into the silence and bring some praise. And it was fun seeing people in the windows there in Rib Lake peeking out and seeing what's going on over there uh, on Main Street at the GYC as people are excited about Jesus. And truly Matt in all his preparation and execution of that event has showed us what it's like to be shaped by what we celebrate. Well, Jesus is our hope. And that's what we are thinking about. He is what we are thinking about uh, in these four weeks running up to really New Year's. We're just going to take the month of December to think about how Jesus is our hope. 
in contrast to all the other things that we are tempted to hope in. And I, I want to give you a challenge in your family or friend groups during the month of December. Uh, I'd like to challenge you to think about all the ways that Jesus is our hope. And I bet you could come up with hundreds of, of ways that Jesus is our hope. Here are some examples. Jesus is our hope because he shows us God's grace. Jesus is our hope because he shows us God's glory. He's our hope because he came to fix our brokenness, because he came to dethrone us, because he guarantees our inheritance in heaven, because he teaches us to weep over our sin, because he makes us alive, because he gives us abundant life, and on and on and on and on. Those are just some examples. Come up with your own list and send them to me, and who knows, it's not a promise, but maybe I'll put them all together and send them to you, all the ways that Jesus is our hope. So over the next four weeks, we're going to pick four reasons that Jesus is our hope. They aren't necessarily the top four, but they're the four that, that, that stick in my mind and have uh, come out of the text for me, and I'll be sharing them with you. Uh, our, our reason for Jesus being our hope today is all about the big picture of redemption. Jesus is our hope because he came to fight and win for us. He came to fight and win for us. And, and we see this theme all throughout the scriptures. And what we want to do today is to, to go to four places. We want to visit four places in scripture, in the plan of redemption, where we see Jesus fighting and winning for us and, and being, being our hope. If you have the little slip that was on your chair, it's almost correct. Um, this week, among, alongside having what felt like about half the church sick, my computer screen went down. So I'm working with three different computers, and I got one version to Alice and another version to Karen, and the slip is almost correct. That's enough complaining. That's all the complaining I'm going to do. It's, yeah, okay, no more complaining. What a week. Um, but I'm going to have us flipping around in the Bible today. I'm not going to do this to you very much. Usually we have one passage that we stick in, but we're going to flip all around the Bible today, or if you've, got a, if you've got a phone like all the trailhead guys here in the front row, then maybe you can just punch it in quickly, but we're going to look at some different passages. First of all, Jesus is our hope in the garden. I'm not going to preach this passage, but I'm going to refer to it. Genesis 3. Why don't, let's go there together. Genesis 3, the first seven verses, well-known passage. Did you know that there's hope in this passage? Let me read it. First seven verses of Genesis 3. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God actually say... Shall you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the servant, serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened. You will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desi desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. And then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. Well-known passage about the fall of humankind. Notice in this passage how there is false hope. There is a lie. There is a deception, which is simply that God is keeping something from you. That's the deception that Satan put into the minds of our first parents. If you could only sit in counsel with God, you'd see that you were left out. That's what he wanted them to think. 
Interesting, this is the very thought that led to the fall of the powerful angel who became Satan. We can see that in Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28. And notice that when Eve and Adam along with her, and he's held responsible, that once they, they bought into, once they bit into this false idea, this falsehood, this deception, they begin to reason from the falsehood and they begin to organize their thoughts and they started making sense of the world according to the deception. We need to eat, don't we? Who? look, there's food. It looks good, doesn't it? Doesn't God want things to look good? God wants us to share, doesn't he? Well, we'll just share with each other. And so they fell. This week, while we were sitting at the table, and I hope, I hope that our families are eating together at a table. Um, the table is where so much great conversation takes place. Because put your phones away, sit at a table and have some conversation. I know I'm messing here, but you ask me to say things like that. Well, we were at the table this week, one of the kids said, why do we say that sin began with Adam and Eve when there was already sin in creation? It's an interesting question, isn't there? But between the creation of the world, which included the angels, and the fall of man, there was already, there was already rebellion in the world in the angelic realm. And yet we, we say that there was no sin in the world. Isn't that interesting? That's a great question. And, and what we see in Scripture is that the, the fall of creation is tied to God's image bearers and not the angels for whom Christ will not die. So yeah, you have rebellion in creation, but when, when, when our first parents sinned, all of creation fell. Creation was tied to God's image bearers, just as redemption will be tied to the second Adam, who is the true image of God. Back to the story. Now that the clear commands of God have been confused, they hope in something other than God himself. They act on it and they sin and shame results, and they realize their nakedness, and we realize that clothing, I love saying this, clothing is not about style, it's about shame. We've had another conversation in our family. Our kids are like, why can't we get some cool masks? <laughs> I mean, we're tired of like washing these rags. Let's go on to like L.L. Bean or Stormy Cromer or something and get some designer masks. Drives me crazy. I'm like, Kids, don't you realize that you, you wear a mask because something is wrong? It's not an opportunity for style points. There's, there's something wrong in the world, so get your ugly mask and put it on. <laughs> this problem has gone all the way back to the beginning. They weren't getting style points. They were ashamed because suddenly they realized who they were before God and yet there's hope in Genesis 3. Let your eyes run down the page, down to verse 15. God is now sorting things out. He's talking to the serpent, and he's going to talk to the woman, then to Eve. And he's talking to the, he's really talking to Satan here. And he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Don't rust, rush to Jesus quite so fast as we rush to him usually in this passage. What this passage is saying is that there is about to be a great struggle between creation and God's image bearers. And he's saying, Satan, you're not going to win. You are not going to win. And there is going to be a theme of a hero, a conqueror, and a redeemer, and that theme is going to grow throughout Scripture, but Satan is not going to win. He is going to lose. You know, we hear that same lie all the time. God is keeping something from us. 
it would be really easy this Christmas to, to list out all the things that we don't get to do. The, the, the events, the family gatherings, the activities that mark time for us, exclusive of last night that was fantastic, but all the other stuff. And we could easily be deeply discouraged in this Christmas season. And yet we have, even in Genesis 3, this promise that we will win because somebody else will fight for us. And we know who that is. There is hope even in the garden. Jesus is our hope because he came to fight and win for us, and that's prefigured in the garden. Second place to visit. Let's go to Jesus' perfect life. And for this, let's go to Matthew 3. Matthew chapter 3. See, we're already in the New Testament. We're moving fast. Matthew chapter 3. Go down to verse 16. We're actually in the last verse of Matthew chapter 3. We are skipping over for the moment Jesus' birth at Bethlehem. We're joining Jesus in his adulthood. We're watching the beginning of his earthly ministry. And we're, he is pressing now toward the cross as he begins his ministry. Matthew 3, verse 16. Then I'm going to read the first verse of chapter 4. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. That's what God thinks of Jesus. And now look at the first verse of Chapter 4, then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Wow, what a contrast that is. You're my son, I approve of you. Now I'm going to lead you into a time of intense temptation. And you know the story here as well. Satan, the same one who tempted Adam and Eve, is going to tempt Jesus, and we're going to see if Jesus, the second Adam, is going to pass the test. Notice the lie here. Notice the deception. You can have it all without the cross. That's what Satan wants Jesus to think. And, and notice the manner of the deception. Jesus is hungry. Satan knows that. And he says, turn these stones into bread and Jesus says, man shall not live by bread alone. In other words, I need to eat. That should remind us of Eve. But my needs aren't what you think. And then Satan takes Jesus up, whether actually or in a vision, we don't know. Takes him up to the top of the temple and he says, throw yourself down from the top of the temple and you're going to look good. And people are going to be amazed by you and they're going to want to follow you. And Jesus says, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. In other words, I won't obey God by looking good or being spectacular. Huh. Same thing Eve thought. Oh, looks good, doesn't it? Jesus' response is different. And then Satan says, worship me and you can have it all. Give you everything that's already yours. Just worship me just once. And Jesus says, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. In other words, God doesn't share his glory except as he chooses. So here you have food, eating, you have looking good, and you have sharing. God's not going to share his glory. That's the deception, and Jesus passes the test perfectly. There's true hope here in Matthew 3 and, and 4. Notice how it ends, verses 10 and 11. Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan. And then the devil left him. Where Adam failed as God's image bearer, Jesus stands in as the second Adam, and he fights and wins for us in his perfect obedience to the Father. And he earns the right to go to the cross, and he buys us back from sin and death. And then throughout Jesus' ministry, at different times, he's going to be tempted not to go to the cross. Think of Peter in Matthew 16. Remember what Jesus said? Get behind me, Satan. He's not really rebuking Peter. He's rebuking the deception behind Peter. 
behind the idea that Jesus could somehow have, have it all, but not go to the cross. 1 John 3, 8, whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared and lived a perfect life, that's the idea, was to destroy the works of the devil. 1 Peter 2, 22, he committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who justifies justly. Hebrews 4.15, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted, just as we are yet without sin. Jesus fought and won for us in his perfect life. You know, we, can, we have the same deception that we hear all the time. You can have it all without Jesus and his cross. Precious little of the reasoning that goes on in this world, in this age, is made with Jesus in mind. You and your choices and your choices of identity deserve to be celebrated. The world owes this to you. We hear that all the time. And yet the way of obedience to God is the one that involves dependence on the one who's already fought and won for us. Jesus is our hope because he came to fight and win for us in his perfect life. Next place to visit, the cross. Let's go to the cross, Luke 23, verse 48 and 49. I'm going to take you to an odd passage uh, that we don't often go to. Luke 23, 48 uh, and 49, really just two verses. This is about what, what happened uh, after the cross, after Jesus has died. This is what it says. And all the crowds that had assembled for this spectacle, when they saw what had taken place, returned home beating their breasts. And all his acquaintances and the women who had followed him from Galilee stood at a distance watching these things. What's the deception here? What's the false hope? Well, it's that there is no hope. Because it's over. Jesus has died on the cross. It's, dying on a cross is a totally hopeless thing. Nobody escapes from the cross. It was a little weird how Jesus gave up his life. Guys didn't typically do that. But he expired all the same. The end came. There was no dramatic rescue. No host of angels. Satan had won after all. And Jesus' followers can return to whatever they were hoping in before. And, and maybe they'll just go fishing because there is no hope. And yet look at what the rest of the New Testament talks about what Jesus accomplished. Next passage, Hebrews 2, verse 14. I told you you'd move around in the Bible today. Hebrews 2, verses 14. Look at how Jesus fights and wins for us at the cross Hebrews 2, verse 14, Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Jesus took on flesh in order to, to die, in order to destroy the devil and his lies. And when we take a bite out of the, the lie that there is no hope, Jesus can help us through the preaching of the gospel. You know, we struggle with the same lie, don't we? There is no hope. Uh, I read this week, and it's a heart-rending statistic, but in the month of October, there were more suicides in the country of Japan than, that, than in the... In, they lost more people to suicide than in the entire COVID epidemic in that country and our country tracks in some manner with 
Japan were, were just a couple of years behind them typically. Uh, a little closer to home, I read this summer that uh, EMTs in Milwaukee were saying that their calls for suicide were up 80%. And I, I haven't kept up with the statistics since, but it, it couldn't be good. Um, it is a hopeless time for those who are not looking to Christ. And, and I feel it too. As I'm, as I'm pattering around here in the dark, when I'm not in quarantine, I'm here in the building. And I come in here and it's dark and it's empty. And, and I can, sometimes I, I do this little thing where I imagine myself sitting at my desk, Pastor Brian, and then I imagine Brian sitting across the desk in my chair and I talk to myself and Pastor, Pastor Brian says, Brian, you're depressed. And, and Brian says to Pastor Brian, yeah, I know I am. Let me tell you about the pandemic. And then Pastor Brian says to Brian, well, let me tell you about the gospel. And then Brian says to Pastor Brian, I know about the gospel. Let's talk about that together. It's really weird. <laughs> and uh, the important thing is that I know I'm having this conversation. That's, <laughs> that's the important the important thing. Don't feel sorry for me, though. I'm probably doing better than you are. <laughs> We're all struggling. Jesus is our hope because he came to fight and win for us at the cross. One more place to visit. Let's go to the tomb. Matthew 28, verse 11. Matthew 28, verse 11. Just a couple of verses here. Here again, an odd little passage. While they were going, this is what happened after the resurrection, so not strictly at the tomb, but after the tomb. While they were going, behold, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priests all that had taken place. And when they had assembled with the elders and taken counsel, they gave a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers and said, Tell people, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they were directed. And this story has been spread among the Jews to this day. What's the deception here? What's the false hope? Well, it's... It's the idea that nothing happened. Nothing to see here. A man hasn't really been raised from the dead like he said he would be. Nothing happened. But even on the surface, that's not true. Because politics happened. And lies happened. And conspiracies and conspiracy theories happened. And dark money happened. And deep state activity happened. And distraction from truth happened. And Something else happened. Look at Colossians 2, 13 to 15. This is what really happened. This is the true hope, as Paul records it in Colossians 2. And you who were dead in your trespasses, in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him. That's what happened. Having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt, that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities. Watch the fighting and winning here. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. You see, only by taking on flesh could Jesus represent those who committed sins in the flesh. Only by suffering our humiliation could Jesus fill out the consequences of our shame to the fullest. Only by satisfying the righteous demands of the Father in himself could Jesus put Satan in his place where that deceiver has nothing to accuse us of. And only by out-tricking the trickster could Jesus render him powerless. And only by coming out of an empty tomb alive could Jesus make us alive. But something else happened. Jesus' followers lived in hope for the rest of their days. And Jesus' followers told the true story about what really happened. And Jesus' followers are doing that still today. Amen? Amen? Because something really happened. 
Jesus is our hope because he came to fight and win for us at the tomb and everywhere. One last passage. You've done a good job. That's a lot of scripture I've thrown at you today. One last passage. Jump into Ephesians 6, because this is where we live today. Ephesians 6, 10 to 13. We read this passage all the time, but read it from the perspective of, of people who depend on Jesus moment by moment and who depend on Jesus who fought and won for us. Think about what it means daily and momently in our lives. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present dark age, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. You see, Satan has been ruined by Jesus who fought and won for us, but he's still around. And, and he knows his time is short, which is why he's so mad. That's what Revelation 12 says for us. But he cannot stand up against us when we depend on Jesus. Notice how this passage doesn't tell us to go out and do something. It's not like there's 12 steps to putting on the armor of God. Don't, it's not, that's not the way to think about it. Stand in what Jesus has already done for you. Don't just do something stand there. Depend on him. Stand firm in what he's already done. Romans 16, 20, got to close with this. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. He's going to get crushed. He's going to be totally out of the picture soon. So grace be with you. Live in that grace and don't be afraid. This is what we got to think about. In our darkness of our world, of our time, Let's celebrate the right things. Let's be shaped and formed by the right things because Jesus, he has fought and won for us. Lord, thank you. Thank you for helping us. Thank you for all the truth that we have in Scripture. Thank you, Jesus, how this theme goes all throughout the Bible about how you entered your creation and overthrew the evil one so that we wouldn't need to be afraid. And truly you fought and truly you have won that's why we have hope. In your name we pray it. Amen. Well, we're going to close the service today by going to the Lord's table together. And uh, that's a pretty, pretty neat way to prepare to go to the table, thinking about what Jesus has done. Why don't we, we who are present here, find the little... I call them McElements. Is that irreverent? Can I say that? It just, I'm sorry. It just looks, maybe we won't do this all the time, but it's, it works for us here right now. Um, the bread and the, the cup that come together, we can start peeling off the little cellophane top. And those of you who are joining us at home, who are trusting in the Lord Jesus, you can, can find your fruit of the vine and bread-like substance now. And as we come to the table, we'll remember that this is the table of the Lord Jesus. And if you know Jesus and if you're trusting in him, he invites you to come and celebrate his victory. And as Dan strums a little bit, we're going to take a moment to reflect. It's been quite a year, hasn't it? We, we do this on the first Sunday of every month, and we had no idea in January what was coming. And here we are, the very last time this year taking the, taking the table together. And we're still here because Jesus fought and won for us. But take a minute to reflect. Uh, thank Jesus for fighting and winning for us. Reaffirm your trust in him. Uh, let's confess our sins to him. Let's confess that we've taken a bite from the lies and false truths 
but then let's thank him for his forgiveness and thank him that we can receive his grace that is full and that is rich and that is free and that we can go on being spotless in his sight. What a feeling to be united with God and, and, and uh, in fellowship with him. And let's take a minute to talk to the Lord. First Corinthians 11 records what went on that night before Jesus gave his life for us. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And so we take the bread. After Jesus shared the bread with his disciples, who were learning oh so much about what Jesus was doing in that moment, he, he took the cup and he made, a, he made a picture of his blood that was about to be poured out for the forgiveness of our sins. And in the same way also he took the cup. After supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. That's the gospel. And when we come together and we take the elements, we proclaim the gospel. That Jesus is alive. We are saved in him. He has fought and won for us. And so we take the cup together. started this morning with joy. Let's close with joy too. Our hope that fights for us and wins. You are my joy. You are my song. You are the well. The one I'm drawing from. My refuge, my whole life long. Oh, where else would I go? Surely, my God is the strength of my soul. Your love defends me, your love defends me when I feel like I'm all.
so we go from this place proclaiming the gospel to each other and, and to ourselves as well. When we look in the mirror, you're dismissed. Thank you, Lord.